So, South Park's 25th season just wrapped up after only six episodes, but for me, these six episodes left an impression, and I'm curious if any of y'all feel the same. To me, season 25 felt like the most vintage South Park we've gotten in years, but it also didn't shy away from certain aspects of modern South Park and still managed to give off those vintage vibes. There were some really great episodes in this bunch, and the show seems to be in a very interesting place with its new production schedule, so let's dive into season 25, what we can expect from the future Paramount Plus specials, and what this all means for the future of South Park. But first, I want to talk about today's video sponsor, Ridge Wallet. Okay, so I'm going to be honest, for years I have been a phone wallet guy. I did these flip wallets even though my friends made fun of me and called me a dad, so I was a bit reluctant to go back to a separate wallet, but I gotta say, these Ridge Wallets are slick. It's very compact, but can fit all of the cards I need and more. It holds up to 12 cards plus cash. I love the texture and the feel of the wallet. It looks really industrial, but it still feels modern. There are over 30 colors and styles, so you can find the one that works for you. I think I'm a Ridge Wallet guy now, and you can be too. Just check out the link in the description of this video and use my coupon code Johnny for 10% off. That's coupon code Johnny for 10% off. Ridge Wallet, check it out. So let's talk about the obvious. Season 25 has four fewer episodes than the 10 we're used to, which I'm sure many fans are bummed about given that these were our first regularly formatted episodes in over two years, which is wild to think about by itself. The last regular episode we got was December 2019 with season 23's finale, Christmas Snow. Then we got two specials on Comedy Central, the pandemic special and the vaccination special, followed by two more specials on Paramount Plus called Post-COVID and Post-COVID The Return of COVID. These apparently all make up season 24, and I'll be curious to see if the Paramount specials end up on any season 24 physical releases. I'm also curious if the Paramount Plus specials that release later this year will be considered part of season 25 as well. Because if you're wondering why season 25 is only six episodes, your answer is actually those Paramount Plus specials. We'll be getting two more of those later this year. Those are about an hour each, so about the same as four to five episodes worth of content. So this year we're getting about the same amount of South Park as usual, it's just spread out between the regular seasons and these two Paramount Plus specials. But let's get into these episodes because like I said before, they really have a vintage vibe to them. I know it's always a little hard coming back from a break, you know. You know, we've had a few distractions. The premiere was called Pajama Day and featured a story that was very kid-focused. Just a much more down-to-earth kid problem that would seem inconsequential if it weren't happening to kids. After the class upsets Mr. Garrison, PC Principal bans the class from participating in Pajama Day, which to the kids is devastating. And I love this simple approach. It feels like the show made a conscious effort to go back to basics for the storyline. Garrison even feels like he's just fully back to normal. No remnants of the Garrison-Trump era, just a completely self-centered teacher who is more preoccupied with his new relationship than his job. Now, obviously, the episode still had loose social commentary and real-world parallels. This is South Park, after all. But once again, this feels much more reeled in than we've seen in a long time. It feels more like they're using real-world events as inspiration to just make dumb jokes. When the entire town of South Park starts wearing their PJs to work in solidarity with the fourth grade class, it sort of becomes a mask parallel. Well, you can't force me to wear pajamas. What is this, Nazi Germany? I also enjoyed how quickly everyone just jumped to Nazi Germany comparisons, which is definitely something people do way too often these days. They're arresting people in pajamas? What is this, Nazi Germany? Look, there are countless issues in the world that awareness should be spread about, but I promise there are more effective ways to convey that than immediately comparing it to Nazi Germany. I think the commentary I appreciated most was PC Principal, though. He basically refuses to go back on his pajama day ban, even though he was wrong to ban them in the first place. Maybe people won't lose respect for you if you change your mind. Saying you were wrong is sometimes the strongest thing you can do. You're totally wrong about that. This really does feel like a problem these days. People are so stubborn and completely unwilling to admit when they've made a mistake, even if they know they made a mistake. PC Principal would rather resign than admit this. Overall, this was a really solid episode. It's not top tier, but I really appreciated that it felt so down to earth, especially after four specials that were just entirely about COVID and our bleak future. But the following episode, The Big Fix, is probably one of my favorites in years. And as the title implies, this one brings a big retcon to the series, but in doing so also makes some pretty great social commentary. When Randy is told that many people are boycotting white-owned cannabis companies because of the ways the war on drugs targeted communities of color, he panics and tries 
tries to get Token's father, Steve, to work with him at Tegrity Farms. But when they come over for dinner, it's revealed that Token's name is actually Tolkien, as in J.R.R. Tolkien, not Token. Obviously, the joke for years is that the Token Black Kid in South Park's name is literally Token Black, but the episode humorously gaslights the entire audience about this. He's named after the guy who wrote The Hobbit and stuff. Yeah, I know. J.R.R. Token. What did you think it was? Look, they even went back on South Park Studios and changed Token to Tolkien on every single clip. Anyone else just assume his name was Token? Because that's disgusting and you are the problem. The audience is put in Stan's shoes here, who realizes that he had unconscious biases about his friend Token the entire time he's known him, and he's really torn up about it. He realizes that he literally tokenized Token, but through his own attempts to try and rectify his mistakes, he actually just further alienates and isolates Tolkien from the rest of the school. He just straight up singles him out. And so I would like to bring up the man himself. Come on up here, Tolkien. Come on. On top of that, Randy spends the entire time tokenizing Tolkien's father, Steve. He's not actually interested in Steve's experience or know-how, he just selfishly wants to get Steve on board with Tegrity Farms to save his own business. He's literally just using him because of his racial identity, and he pays for it when Steve buys the farm across the street and starts doing better than Tegrity Farms later in the season. They took everything I learned about using black culture to make a bigger profit, and they're doing it themselves! This episode is not only super funny, but surprisingly insightful. It's it's got a lot to say about performative allyship. Stan wasn't really concerned about the way he may have tokenized Tolkien, he was actually concerned about how that reflected on himself. The way he went about trying to rectify the situation was selfish and actually just harmed Tolkien more. I actually think this episode was inspired by the discourse surrounding the upcoming Lord of the Rings show. There are a ton of fans who are up in arms because there are black actors cast in the series, and allegedly Tolkien's books didn't explicitly describe characters with darker skin in Middle-earth. If this kind of fan behavior sounds super embarrassing to you, that's because it definitely is. But I like that Matt and Trey opted to just use this drama as the tiniest inspiration for an otherwise barely related episode, and it gave us one of our best in years. The next episode, City People, was another that I really liked. This was just absolutely vintage Cartman. When Leanne has to get a job as a real estate agent, to support her family, Eric is not happy about it. Mommy is just going to be working a few days a week and you can be a big boy and take care of yourself. No! So he goes so far out of his way to manipulate his mom into agreeing not to work. Eric becomes a real estate agent himself and drives up real estate market value to ridiculous levels by selling to rich city folks. This leads to the South Park Chamber of Commerce open firing on an open house that Eric is holding in an attempt to put an end to his realty group. But there's only one thing that will get him to stop even when he's inches from death. Will you stop all this if I quit my job? <laughs> Like I said before, this is just vintage Cartman. In its broadest strokes, it's reminiscent of classics like Scott Tennerman Must Die, where Cartman just goes through an obscene amount of trouble to get back at somebody when he feels he's been slighted. The funny thing being that Eric's capabilities, shown within the episode, prove that he would be absolutely fine on his own. He doesn't actually need his mom's help or support 24-7 like he claims. He's just completely self-centered. The episode also has a hilarious portrayal of rich city folks who can't speak in full sentence is often just spitting out single trendy words. Metal bottle water? LaCroix? LaCroix! Metal bottle water? Edamame! Though I gotta say, for people who don't eat dairy, oat milk is a godsend. 1,000 times better than that almond milk shit. The next episode is probably the most topical of the season, but even that felt pretty rooted in its characters. Aptly titled Back to the Cold War, it focuses on the growing concern over Putin and Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but they basically make it all about Mr. Mackey's fear of getting older as he regresses into a weird nostalgic obsession for the Cold War era. The subplot also feels like a pretty classic butter story as he competes in dressage events with his horse Melancholy. This ties into the primary Cold War plot by pitting him against a Russian opponent, which seems like it's primarily meant to criticize the people who are focusing on cheering against Russian athletes amidst these ongoing conflicts. And they're right, that shit is completely unrelated to the actual conflict and it's bizarre to conflate the two. And of course, the end of the episode has Putin admit that he's getting older and his dick has stopped working, which is very much a classic South Park move. I'm just gonna sound like a broken record, but the next one, Help My Teenager Hates Me, once again has a very vintage vibe. The kids are stoked when they discover airsoft guns, but in order to play, they're all paired up with teenagers for their team. The episode quickly becomes about how awful and nonsensical teenagers can be. Can you make me some fucking food? Well, yeah, like what kind of food do you want? 
Fucking leave me alone! I'm curious what specifically inspired this episode idea. Matt and Trey have kids, but I don't think any of them are teenagers yet. Regardless, it's a really funny episode, and the ending is actually super sweet. All of the kids' dads team up with them to take down the teenagers, and they all bond over it. I love this little scene where they're all walking home together after the fight. The lighting is beautiful, and it's just a nice, heartfelt sequence. Honestly, it even kind of blew my mind that Randy shows up in this episode in his old outfit. No Tegrity Farms uniform, just good old Randy doing dad things. Which of course shifts wildly for the season finale, the Credigree Weed St. Patrick's Day special. So there's a ton I like about this episode, but it is undoubtedly the one that feels the most modern as far as South Park goes. But that isn't a bad thing because it leads to some very funny metatextual moments, as well as some ridiculous Randy nonsense. This follows up the second episode by focusing again on Randy's newfound rivalry with Steve Black, and of course his new weed farm Credigree. While Randy has generally had some pretty great success with Tegrity, it seems like karma is starting to catch up with him as almost Almost nothing goes right for him here on out. But I think what made me laugh the most was how the kids play into the story. Because after five very classic feeling episodes that are primarily focused on the kids and their adventures, Randy rampages through with the Tegrity stuff once again. And the way the kids react is so funny. It's like they really just want to enjoy their St. Patrick's Day, but Randy keeps roping them into his misadventures. Yeah, well his piece of shit dad is trying to take over the St. Patrick's Day special! I don't care. It's like the show Tegrity Farms keeps trying to force the kids to leave their regular South Park adventure to help in the Tegrity Farms adventure. It's a pretty funny way to play it. Did anyone else notice that they used music from South Park's Stick of Truth in this sequence? What I'm upset about is a wee little thing called cultural appropriation. Ever heard of it? I can't believe how immediately that made me want to play through that game again. This one has another classic Butters subplot. He pinches a classmate for not wearing green on St. Patrick's Day and immediately gets arrested for sexual harassment. Kind of a perfect Butters predicament, to be honest. The episode completely flies off the rails later, though. Randy breaks out of jail with these St. Patrick's Day powers, and then the literal St. Patrick comes down and starts sexually harassing everyone. I think this is probably my least favorite episode of the season, but I still think it had some really great stuff in it. Season 25 is such an oddity, because while it it does represent this return to more grounded storytelling for South Park, especially after the specials from last year, it doesn't completely abandon the things they've established in the past few seasons. There are still serialized elements, however small. The only real things they continue through this season are Cartman moving into the hot dog house in episode 3, and the Credigree Farm storyline from episode 2 and episode 6. Tegrity Farm still factors in, even in the more grounded episodes. It feels like it's a really nice balance of old and new, and it actually has me really excited for this new era of South South Park. If this is the new normal, we could see some pretty cool stuff. But I'm really curious how and when they'll be tackling this year's Paramount Plus specials. There will definitely be a break after these six episodes, but after last year's specials largely taking place 40 years in the future, I'm so curious if they're going to do something comparably out there, or if it will just feel like an hour-long South Park episode. I'm really hopeful that they'll experiment more with the Paramount Plus stuff to make it really stand apart from the series, which was definitely the case last year, even though the post-COVID specials still tied into the events of the series. But I'm just thinking about the bigger adventures they've done in multi-part episodes episodes, like Imagination Land, or the Coon and Friends trilogy, or even the big epic stories from the South Park games. But wow, season 25 really was such an interesting set of episodes. Not what I expected at all going into the season, but it was really refreshing in a way that I appreciated. I think the MVP is definitely the big fix, but literally every episode had at least one classic element that I enjoyed, and it's got me really curious about the future of the show. I hope they go nuts with the Paramount Plus specials this year. If I were going to guess, I'd say we'll get them towards the back half of the year, closer to when South Park seasons usually air, so like September, but who knows? But what do you guys think of season 25? Did it feel like vintage South Park to you, or do you completely disagree with everything I said? And what do you want to see out of the Paramount Plus specials? Let me know below in the comments, and I'll see you next time. Peace. Johnny! Two challenge.